Hello everyone, welcome to Cashcroft TV. My name is Kalen Ashcroft. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ages of Empires, where we will be covering all of the major world empires throughout history, as well as a major leader from each respective empire, and a comparison between each pair of leaders. Today we will be covering the Neo-Assyrian Empire and the Median Empire. I think this is a very fascinating episode in my opinion because these two empires actually directly interacted with each other, so it'll be cool a head-to-head -head comparison. As well, we will be covering Tiglath Pilesar III, who will be the significant leader from the Neo-Assyrian Empire we will biograph, as well as Sayazares of the Median Empire, who is the significant leader of the Median Empire who we will biograph. So, without further ado, we will begin with the Neo-Assyrian Empire. So this is the third ep uh, coverage of an Assyrian Empire. We've covered the Old, or the First Assyrian Empire, as well as the Middle Assyrian Empire, and this is the third, um, or pardon me, the Neo-Assyrian Empire, which is its greatest extant, or its greatest achievement. Some even consider this the well, it was the largest empire up to this point. However, some consider it as the first world empire because they actually proactively had an endeavor to want to create world domination. So a very, very important empire. And if you haven't already checked out the previous episodes on the old Assyrian Empire and the middle Assyrian Empire, I hope you do. So starting with the rise of the Neo-Assyrian Empire from the 10th to the 8th century BCE. So the Neo-Assyrian Neo Empire was a powerful ancient civilization that emerged in the 10th century BCE and played a significant role in the shaping of the ancient Near East. Therefore, we will seek to find the causes of its, both its rise and its fall to perhaps extrapolate and find takeaways that might implicate, have implications on modern empires. So starting with its early expansion from the 10th and the 9th, century BCE. So the Assyrians were originally inhabitants of northern Mesopotamian region, of the northern Mesopotamian region, known as Ashur, and initially were a small city-state. Under the rule of King Ashurnasipal the second, who, lived, who reigned from 883 to 859 BCE, Assyria began expanding its territory through military conquest, focusing on northern Mesopotamian part, uh, northern parts of Mesopotamia. However, I would think that's a kind of a, an understatement to say that it was a city-state before the the old Assyrian Empire and the Middle Assyrian Empire did dominate the regions during their respective times. As for Tiglath Pileser the third and the centralization in the 8th century BCE. So Tiglath Pileser III reigned from 745 to 727 BCE and is considered a pivotal role in the empire's history. He reformed the administration, military, and taxation systems, centralizing the power in the capital city of Nimrud, or Kalhu. So it's important, I, I note, that taxation means necessarily they had private enterprises, so perhaps a little different from the Egyptian model, where it was pretty much one big city, one big government bureaucracy, whereas to have taxation, you necessarily have to have some sort of private enterprises. His aggressive policies led to the rapid expansion of Assyrian territories, reaching as far as the Mediterranean coast and the Zagros Mountains. We'll have a more specific biography of his life to come in this episode. As for Sargon II and Korosbad, from 721 to 705 BCE. So Sargon II, who ruled from 721 to 705 BCE, moved the capital to Korosbad, in, or dur Sharukin, and continued the policy of territorial expansion. He established a more stable administrative structure and focused on urban development. So something that perhaps, as we can see in some of these images here, the Neo-Assyrian Empire had much more perhaps significant structures and bigger cities, whereas the Middle and the Old Assyrian Empires were a little bit more nomadic, but they still did have prominent cities, namely Assur. As for the peak of the empire from the 8th to the 7th century BCE, under Sennacherib, 
and the great palace at Nineveh. So Sennacherib, who ruled from 705 to 681 BCE, moved the capital to Nineveh, one of the most splendid cities in the ancient world. He constructed the Grand Palace and laid out extensive gardens, famously known as the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, which was later conquered by Alexander the Great, which were located in Nineveh. As for Esar Hardon and Ashurbanipal, reigned from 681 to 627 BCE, Ashur Hadon continued his father Sennacherib's policies of expansion and conquest. Ashurbanipal, who reigned from 668 to 627 BCE, is known for his patronage of learning, and he established the Library of Ashurbanipal, one of the earliest known libraries in the world, containing a vast collection of cuneiform texts. So, very important to note that not only was the Neo-Assyrian Empire the most successful to date in terms of military conquest, they also created much in the forms of literary development, perhaps the oldest library known to the world and some very significant architectural achievements, but as well as the famous Hanging Gardens of Babylon, which doesn't exist anymore, but is supposedly one of the most beautiful sites one could imagine. But as for the joint rule with Shamashun Ukin, so upon the death of Esar Hadon, so Esar Hadon was the father of Ashurbanipal, Ashurbanipal ascended to the throne in Assyria, while his brother, Shamash Shu'ekin Kun um, ruled over Babylonia. So they were very powerful at this time, but the two brothers ruled over different regions, so necessarily a, a weakened centralized government, but at least they're brothers and it seemed like they got along pretty well. This dual kingship was part of Esarhaddon's effort to maintain control over the vast empire, so maybe in part it was through necessity because the empire was so big they needed to have two rulers to rule. But moving to the decline and fall, starting with internal conflicts and revolts. So Assyria's vast empire began to face internal problems, including revolts from subject peoples and struggles for succession. So twofold, because they had such many different cultures under their rule, there started to be revolts from those particularly in the non-majorities as well as struggles for succession, probably already set once it was divided amongst two brothers after as we'll later see under Charlemagne's rule, he divides it across his three sons, who inevitably must fight. And as we see, there's actually a lot of that in the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, too. As for the Babylonian Rebellion and the Medes Chaldean Alliance, 626 to 612 BCE, Nabopolassar, a Chaldean leader, led a rebellion against Assyrian rule in Babylon, capitalizing on the empire's internal weakness. And in 612 BCE, an alliance between Medes and the Chaldeans, who were a significant tribal group in Babylonia under Sayazaris and Nabopalassar, respectively, led to the siege and eventual decline and fall of Nineveh, which was, at the time, um, one of their most significant cities, and at the time, even, their capital up until 612 BCE. So, and we will cover Medes in the next history. As for the final collapse from 612 to 609 BCE, after they moved their capital to Haran, the fall of Nineveh marked the end of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. As the empire's territory was divided among the victors, with the Medes taking much of the northern regions and the Babylonians controlling the south, specifically the Chaldeans, they were fragmented and essentially destroyed, and then 609 BCE is considered its end date. Thus, the fall of the Neo-Assyrian Empire marked a significant shift in the political landscape of the ancient Near East. The Babylonians and Medes rose to prominence, while the Assyrian culture, language, and administrative practices influenced subsequent empires in the region, despite its eventual collapse. And despite this, the Neo-Assyrian Empire left an enduring legacy in the annals of ancient history in the region, so their people were still so subsumed into the Babylonian and Median empires, and also their vision for world domination, I would think, certainly inspired their enemies. So as for a specific biography of Tiglath Pileser III, who reigned from 745 to 727 BCE, known as the Great Reformer and Conqueror. 
So as for his early life and ascension, Tiglath Pileser III was born in 742 BCE as Pul. So pardon me, that's not his reign. He only lived a very short period of time. So he was born though Pul. And we have previously covered Tiglath Pileser I. However, there seems to be no blood relation. But he later changed his name upon becoming king to Tiglath Pileser III. And he hailed from a distinguished military family and served as a high-ranking general before his ascension to the throne, but not necessarily from a royal family. Um, and in 745, so I think some of these dates must be mixed up, but there's many different ways of um, calculating it. But nonetheless, he sees the throne through the form of a palace coup. So they sort of took over the capital through military um, measures. And after that, he changed his name. It seems like throughout history, especially looking at the Roman Empire, which came obviously much later, but there's some sort of names were quite flexible for conquerors. Some, some emperors would call themselves Augustus, some would call themselves Caesar, some would call themselves Alexander, some to the, to the extent of their success. But this is long before it. But nonetheless, this individual Pul, which is quite a humble sounding name, changed his name to Tiglath Pileser, who was one of the greatest leaders of the former Assyrian Empire. As for his military reforms, one of Tiglath Pileser III's most significant contributions was extensive military reforms. He transformed the army into a highly organized professional force with standardized equipment, training, and tactics. So that's a very important detail, standardized equipment. So before that, they had non-standardized equipment for the large part, so much more chaotic. He introduced the concept of standing armies, reducing the reliance on conscription and ensuring a rapid response to threats. So that's a very profound uh, change to have a standing army, which is something that modern, many modern states do not have. But nonetheless, it's contrast to conscription, where there's a war, they suddenly call upon all the villagers, etc., to fight a battle. Having a standing armor, army constantly trained and constantly prepared for battle is quite an innovation. As for his administrative reforms, Tiglath Pileser III centralized power in the Assyrian capital of Nimrud, or Kala, streamlining the administration of the empire. He established a system of provincial governors who were directly accountable to the central authority. So, almost like a federal system. As for territorial expansion, Tiglath Pileser III was an ambitious conqueror known for his aggressive campaigns. He rapidly expanded the Assyrian borders, focusing on the northern regions of Mesopotamia and beyond. His conquests extended into the areas such as Syria, Anatolia, and the Levant, and he subjugated Armenian, Armenian, and Neo Hittite states. So, we covered the Hittites previously, which I hope. You have or will endeavor to check out and establish a searing control over the Phoenician cities. As for revolt, suppression, and stability, Tiglath Pileser III faced various internal revolts and insurrections within his empire. He responded swiftly and brutally, suppressing any challenges to his rule and maintaining internal stability. So it's very important that coming into power through a military coup that he maintained a strong hand throughout all his reign. Otherwise, for example, if someone has a military coup, why not? Why could it not happen again? So he must, so it had to lead with a strong hand, as he did. As for his cultural contributions, while primarily known for his milit military and administrative prowess, Tiglath Pileser III also contributed to cultural development of the Assyrian Empire. He initiated various building projects, including the construction of many palaces and temples, which inspired later rulers of the Neo-Assyrian Empire as well. As for his legacy and historical significance, Tiglath Pileser III's reign marked a turning point in Assyrian history. His military reforms and conquests laid the groundwork for the expansionist policies of later rulers. His centralized administration and professionalized army set a standard for subsequent empires in the region. His legacy contributed significantly to the enduring power and influence of the Neo-Assyrian Empire until its ultimate decline and fall. As for his death and succession, Tiglath Pileser III died in 727 BCE, leaving behind a powerful and well-organized empire. He was succeeded by his son, Shalmaneser V, who continued his father's policies. Tiglath Pileser III's reign stands as a testament to the exceptional military and to his exceptional military and administrative abilities. 
His reforms and conquests played a crucial role in establishing the Neo-Assyrian Empire as a dominant force in the ancient Near East. So very, very important leader, um, debatably even more significant than Tiglath-Pileser I. So as for the content of the slide, so the title we have here is Tiglath-Pileser and the Neo-Assyrian Empire, which is the fourth and final Assyrian Empire. Yes, it is true that there is a later period in Assyrian history, but it wouldn't be necessarily considered an empire as the old, middle, and neo-periods would. S um, a small distinction, the new it's called the new, old, middle, and new Egyptian empires as opposed to the first, middle, and neo-Assyrian empires, so slightly different naming conventions most commonly between the Egyptian history and the Assyrian history. It was also the largest empire to this point, and some consider it the first world empire with a world domination ideology. As for the details we have here, significant leader Tiglath-Pileser III, Empire, Neo-Assyrian, period circa 911 to 609 BCE, region Mesopotamia, Levant, Egypt, Anatolia, Arabia, Iran, and Armenia. Million square kilometers, 1.40. So this is by far the largest. So far we haven't actually had one that reached a million square kilometers this one does, and also it's the first to pass, I believe, 1% as well. Million square miles, 0.54% of the world, excluding Antarctica, 1.4%, so the largest by area, certainly. Capital city was at first Assur, where um, the, the coup was held, at, or if not in Nam, uh, Namrud, but the capital city was 911, uh, from 911 to 879 BCE. The capital city was Namrud from 879 to 706 BCE. Dur Shar Kin from 706 to 705 BCE. To Nineveh from 705 to 612 BCE with the famous Babylonian hanging gardens until it was conquered later by the Babylonians. And Haran from 612 to 609 BCE in its final years. To see if I, I know the where the coup was held. I would think the coup was held in Assur because that was the first capital city. So I think that is where Tiglath Pileser III had his coup. As for the government, was a monarchy. Common languages: Akkadian, which is the main language of the Assyrians, but as well as Aramaic, is another major la language of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. As for religion, ancient Mesopotamian, and population five to six million. So also significantly one of the largest in terms of population, if not the largest so far. As for images, in the top left we have an image of Tiglath Pileser III holding looks like some kind of stick. I don't think he's in prayer. I think that's more of a uh, maybe a horse beating stick, but he could be in prayer. I think relative to some of the other empires, I think the Mesopotamians or particularly the Assyrians were a little less religious than, for example, the Egyptians, but nonetheless they certainly were religious as, as well. To the right of that we have um, the image depicting Tiglath Pileser III's capture of Damascus, seeing them raiding there and seeing them have their uniform military equipment, also from their standing army. Also, see that they have control over horses and some sort of chariots. Below that, I find this very beautiful image of the fall of Nineveh, which is kind of the, the big defeat for the Neo Assyrians. So, very dark looking image, very chaotic, red, but also an, 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 we can imagine how beautiful their architecture was. To the right we have a recreation of what Sargon II's palace at Dur Sharukin might have looked like, so also incredible architecture. And above that we have the, a map of approximately the regions of the Neo-Assyrian Empire, and we can see the different dates. And at, at its greatest extant, when it was 1.4 million, is the lightest shade of orange. So really covering a significant amount of the world, including, yeah, all the way down up to Judah and to Ga all the way to Gaza in the southwest, up in the north east, all the way as far as um, uh, almost even into the Ukraine, modern day Ukraine. So absolutely uh, massive. That would be, uh, or pardon me. All the way up into not the Ukraine, the Ukraine, so pardon me, much to the northwest of that. That's Urartu, which is an empire we previously covered 
Pardon me, that's a red. I should not have said Ukraine, that is very off. But, and we can also see Medes, who will cover soon, right to the east. And to the south, we can also see some of the ancient regions we covered, such as Uruk, Ur, Babylonia, in the south, and up in the northwest, we can see as far as uh, uh, some of these, many of these we, we haven't covered yet, but also uh, all the way up significantly into Turkey. So that is Tiglath Pileser III and the Neo Assyrian Empire, who we'll discuss the leader more in a comparison to come. So, as for the rise and fall of the Median Empire from 728 to 549 BCE, the empire officially starting in 678 BCE. So, starting with early origins from the, in the 9th and the 8th century BCE. The Medes were an ancient Ira Iranian, which is Iranian, but I think the correct pronunciation is Iranian, people who inhabited the northwestern part of present-day Iran. They were initially a tribal society with loose political organizations. As for the diocese and the rise of the Median statehood from 728 to 675 BCE, Diocese, a legendary figure, is credited with uniting the Median tribes and establishing a centralized monarchy around 728 BCE. He founded the Median capital, Ekbatana, which is modern-day Hamadan, as well, diocese rule is characterized by his efforts to consolidate power and establish a well-organized state. As for Pharotes and expansion from 675 to 653 BCE, Pharotes, diocese's son, continued his father's work by further expanding the Median territory. He waged successful campaigns against the neighboring regions, including Assyria. As for the Scythian invasion and Saia Zares, 653 to 625 BCE, the Scythians, a nomadic people from Central Asia, invaded Media around 653 BCE, leading to a period of turmoil. Cyaceres, Zares, son of Far Pharaotes, Ferrarotes, I believe is Ferrarotes, who is Diocese's son, successfully expelled the Scythians and in initiated a series of military campaigns to reclaim lost territories. He forged alliances, including one with Babylon. So, we will cover Saia Zares in specific detail in a biography, but even now, one of his early achievements was that they were getting invaded by the Scythians and he repelled them. As for the fall of Assyria and rise to prominence from 614 to 612 BCE, so Cyrus after repelling the Scythians, played a crucial role in the fall of the Neo-Assyrian Empire, which we just covered, and he formed a coalition with Babylon, particularly the Chaldeans, who were a Babylonian tribe, and they successfully besieged Nineveh in that beautiful image we previously saw, and dismantled the once mighty Assyrian Empire in 612 BCE. So, as we see a direct interaction between the two empires here under Cyrus and um, as for upon as we noted um, upon the death of as this was partly um, they were perhaps partly weakened because the Assyrian state was already divided between um, into different had they had two heads of state at the time as previously mentioned as for expansion and alliances from 612 to 585 BCE under Cyrus and his successor, Astyages, the Median Empire continued to expand its influence. They established alliances with neighboring powers, including the Lydian Empire and Babylon, particularly the Chaldeans. As for the rise in Persia and the fall of Media from 559 to 549 BCE, so the rise of Cyrus the Great, so one of the most famous leaders of all time, as many of you might have heard of, leader of the Persian Achaemenid, Empire marked a significant challenge to the Medes. Cyrus initiated a rebellion against Median rule. In the Battle of Opus, 550 BCE, and the Battle of Pasagade, 549 BCE, the Persians decisively defeated the Medes, leading to incorporation of Media into the burgeoning Achaemenid Empire. So, the Median Empire is really a keystone empire, and that led to the defeat of the Neo Assyrian Empire, but they were defeated by the Achaemenid Empire under Cyrus the Great. 
As for legacy, while the Median Empire lasted rough for roughly two centuries, not too long, its influence, maybe even one century depending on how we count it, its influence on the subsequent Achaemenid Empire was profound, not to mention being the one along with the Chaldeans to defeat the Neo-Assyrians Empire. Many administrative and cultural practices of the Medes were adopted and further developed by the Persians. Ekbatana, or modern-day Hamadan, remained an important cultural and administrative center, serving as a summer capital for the Achaemenid kings, so evidently invested significantly into the architecture, or maybe the region was so great, nonetheless, it was a summer capital for the kings of the Persian Empire, or the Achaemenid Empire. Furthermore, the fall of the Median Empire paved the way for the rest of the Achaemenid Empire, which would go on to become one of the largest empires in ancient history, encompassing much of the known world. So, as we're starting to go through time, empires are getting bigger and bigger. Thus, the rise and fall of the Median Empire played a crucial role in the geopolitical landscape of the ancient Near East, setting the stage for the dominance of the Achaemenid Empire under Cyrus the Great and his successors. So, very, very important empire. As for biography of Cyazares, from 625 to 585 BCE, founder of the Median Empire. But um, maybe that's an exaggeration because it was his actual, I believe his grandfather, Dioeses, who connected the, or united the tribes of Medes. So that, whoever gave him that title, which was not me, I saw that somewhere, but I think he's maybe the, the one who brought it to its pinnacle, but nonetheless, I'd say the most significant leader under the Median Empire. And some consider maybe, I guess maybe the reason he's considered the founder is that after they defeated the, or repelled the Scythians, they were officially a solidified empire. After the Scythians were invading there, their establishment was contested or debatable. Nonetheless, we'll detail this. So Cyrus was born in 625 BCE into the Median royal family during a period of upheaval following the Scythian invasion of Media, Medea. He ascended the throne at a critical juncture in the Median Empire, as the Median Empire was weakened by internal strife and external threats, particularly the Scythians. As for his reign and reorganization, Cyazares devoted his early reign to reorganizing the Median state. He worked to strengthen the military, reform administrative structures, and rebuild the empire's territorial integrity by repelling the Scythians who were invading. Furthermore, he formed an alliance with Babylon. One of Cyazares' most significant moves was forming a coalition with Nabopolassar, the Chaldean ruler of Babylon. This alliance was instrumental in the overthrow of the Neo-Assyrian Empire and the capture of Nineveh in 612 BCE. As for the expansion of the Median Empire, following the fall of Nineveh and following also the repelling of the Scythians, Cyazares and his Babylonian ally expanded their territorial holdings, with Cyazares consolidating control over what, much of what had been the Assyrian Empire. So the Assyrian Empire had been the largest empire to date, and if we include much of that territory, the Median Empire is now the largest to date. As for his cultural contributions, while primarily known for his military and political achievements, Cyazares also made, uh, made cultural contributions. He encouraged the arts and sciences within the empire, fostering intellectual development. Very important patron of the arts, which as we see, almost true for every leader we've covered so far. As for the conflict with the Lydian kingdom, Cyazares engaged in a protracted conflict with the Lydian kingdom in Anatolia. The war is notable for the intervention, uh, or the intervention of the solar eclipse in 585 BCE, which, according to historical accounts, led to a peace treaty. So, evidently, quite, um, I guess, they, they, they were con certainly concerned about the celestial body. So they had this this battle with a or conflict with the Lydians, and they see a solar eclipse in 585, and they saw it as a sign of a need for a peace treaty. Perhaps there were underlying uh, p policy reasons instead, but as history is written, it was the solar eclipse that caused the peace treaty. So maybe it tells us quite a, quite a bit about the what people believed back then. As for legacies, 
Caesar's reign led to the foundation of the Median Empire's prominence in the ancient Near East, both by repelling the Scythians and defeating the Neo-Assyrians. His military successes and di diplomatic skills were instrumental in reshaping the geopolitical landscape. As for his succession and successor, Cyrus was succeeded by his son, Astyages, who continued his father's policies and ruled until the fall of the Median Empire and the rising of the Persian Achaemenid Empire. So, unfortunately, his son was less successful, but nonetheless, um, very much influenced by Cyrus's philosophies and work. As for historical significance, Cyrus is remembered as a pivotal figure in the Iranian plateau, playing a crucial role in the fall of the Neo-Assyrian Empire and the consolidation of the Median Empire. Thus, Cyrus' reign marked a transformative period in the Median Empire, from internal reorganization to successful military campaigns and strategic alliances. His legacy reverberated through the ancient world and contributed to the shaping of subsequent empires in the Near East. That, that's a very, very fascinating and important leader, and I think at least inspiring to me, and I hope to you as well. Um, so we will discuss the content of the slide now, and then we'll discuss him a bit more in a comparison. So title, we have Cyazaris and the Median Empire, or Median Empire, known as perhaps destroyers of the Neo-Assyrian Empire, with the Chaldeans, their, uh, their ally of Babylon. As for the information we have here, significant leaders, Cyazares, Empire, Medes, period 678 to circa 549 BCE, modern location, Iran, Iraq, and Turkey, million square kilometers, 2.8 million square miles, 1.08, so the first to hit over 1 million square miles, percent of the world, 2.08, capital, Ekbatana. Monarchy, government, monarchy, common language, Median, religion, ancient Iranian, Mithraism, Mithraism, and early Zoroastrianism. Zoro Zoroastrianism. Pardon me for my pronunciation. I always say people, when some people criticize people's pronunciation, I often think, oh, well, maybe that's good because it meant they read the thing before they heard the thing. So I don't. My, just my defense here. Population hundreds of thousands to a few million. So it's interesting that supposedly the geographical extent of the Median Empire was larger than the Neo-Assyrian Empire because they conquered much of that territory. The population was quite lower, so they had maybe a lot of vassals. In the top left, we have an image of Cyazaris, perhaps more likely in prayer than we had of Tiglath Pileser III, but maybe in some other action to tell, but I think he's in prayer here. And perhaps that's why maybe he was um, decided to have a peace treaty after a solar eclipse. Maybe he was quite, uh, quite more religious than maybe the Neo-Assyrians. To the right, we have some excavations of the, of, um, the capital, which is Ekbatana, so a place I'd very much like to visit. Below that, we have an image of uh, a few images. Perhaps I'll cover all three in the Below that, and to the right and to the right, we have three images of battles between the Medeans and the Persians. So we can kind of see the differences in their uniforms. Actually, look rather similar, but nonetheless, they had uniform uniforms. So that's something important to note and very well equipped. It seemed like the spear was their major weapon. Below that, we have what's called a riton, which is a drinking vessel. It looks to me like a gauntlet, but supposedly they drank out of it. And in the top right, we have a map showing the region in which they covered an uh, absolutely massive region, all the way from Cappadocia in the northwest, all the way down to uh, Persia, or Persis, um, which who were ultimately the ones to defeat them. But even all the way through Armenia into, as we can see, Sagartia, and just a, a massive extent of land. So that is Caesaris and the Median Empire, and now we will go into comparison between these two great leaders. So, Tiglath Pileser III of the Neo-Assyrian Empire and Cyazaris of the Median Empire. So, background, starting with Tiglath Pileser III, he was born in 742 BCE in a, with a military background, and he ascended through a palace coup which he led, so he came from a military family, not 
a royal family. Also important to note, his name was Pul, P-U-L, before changing his name to Tiglath Pileser III. So he was not actually related to Tiglath Pileser I, who we covered previously. Caesares, in the, on the other hand, was born around 625 BCE into a period of upheaval following the Scythian invasion in Medea. He ascended during a period of instability, however, from a royal family. So for whom was it harder? Well, Tiglath Pileser III, who perhaps was was maybe more self-made, but he was the one causing the problems. He's the one who caused the coup. Whereas Caesares was born into the royal family, but they were in political turmoil and a military turmoil after the Scythian invasion. So he really had to restore his family's name. So, which is more difficult, impossible to say. I think they're both very challenging like, situations to come into. So important to note that despite their difficult situation, or perhaps take like Pilisar the third made his own difficult situation by causing the coup in the first place, they still took their circum initial circumstances and still achieved great things. As for military reforms, Tiglath Pileser III introduced the extensive reforms. He standardized equipment, advanced tactics, and formed standing armies. So three very important things, particularly the, the first and the third I note, in that this, having standardizing equipment is much easier for training. If one person has a battle axe and the other has a spear and somebody's trying to train them, it's like, who knows what to do? Whereas if everyone has a spear, it's like, okay, we can make them learn certain moves, certain tactics, it's much more formalized. And one might have some sort of expectation as to what the, the individual to the left or the right might be doing. And as well as standing armies, which is something quite innovative, especially during this time. So that's having a standing army is at all times constantly trained likely better soldiers generally. As for Cyrus Ares, he had, was a skilled military leader and he focused on reorganizing the state and strengthening the military foundations. So can't say necessarily he brought these same reforms that Tiglath Pileser III, but evidently what he did institute was more successful than his predecessors because he was the one to repel the Scythians and he was the one to defeat the Neo-Assyrians. So maybe they even did what the Neo-Assyrians did but better. As for territorial expansion, Tiglath Pileser III was an aggressive, had aggressive expansionist policies, reaching the Mediterranean coast all the way to the Zagros Mountains, or Zagros Mountains. As for Cyazaris, he consolidated control over former Assyrian territories and doing so through forming strategic alliances. So Cyazaris, or particularly, or his empire more generally did maybe claim more territory, but much of it was just through defeating the Neo-Assyrian Neo Empire, whereas Neo-Assyrian Empire may have done all the base work by clearing out what was there before. And the, the uh, Medeans relied more, and sorry, sorry, relied more on alliances. For example, could he have defeated the Neo-Assyrians if he did not ally himself with the Chaldeans and the Babylonians? I propose not, but he was wise to do to make that alliance because it ultimately resulted in their success and maybe if they had maintained more alliances maybe they would not have been defeated by the later Achaemenid or the Persian Empire. As for centralization, the centralization of power in Nimrud by Tiglath Pileser or Kala streamlined administration and established provincial governors. So it's important to note that maybe the coup was done in Ashur or Assur but he he made the capital cities a different place, perhaps maybe because there was a, a bad reputation from Asher after the coup. But nonetheless, having making a new capital allowed for centralization of authority. You can see, as we'll see in the French Empire, or particularly, particularly the earlier French Empire under or the French monarchy under Louis the Fourteenth, he created Versailles outside of Paris as a way of centralizing authority by. If the leader is far away from the people, they sort of deify them, and also they're harder to uh, affect. As for the centralization of Sayazaris, he's working. He worked on the reorganization of the Median state and strengthening its foundations. So, sort of perhaps restoring it, but also making it better than it ever was before. As for alliances, Tiglath Pileser focused on military conquests and territorial expansions, but little on alliances. Whereas Cyazares formed a crucial coalition with Babylon, which was pivotal in the fall of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. So maybe a check mark to Cyazares there. 
As for conflict and expansion, there was Tiglath Pileser III engaged in rapid territorial expansion through military campaigns, whereas Sayazares successfully expanded Median territory, consolidating control over former Assyrian lands. So a lot of it was sort of consolidating the destroyed, the, the aftermath of the destroyed Neo Assyrian Empire, which takes skill in itself. As for cultural contributions, starting with Tiglath Pileser III, he was known for his military and administrative achievements, but less so for his patronage of the arts. Whereas Cyazaris is a little bit more known for his encouragement of the arts and sciences, which fostered intellectual development, but still probably more prominently known for his military achievements. Thus, both Tiglath Pileser III and Cyazaris were pivotal figures in their respective empires, each leaving a distinct mark of the, on the ancient Near East through their military, administrative, and diplomatic endeavors. Tiglath Pileser III's descendants would go on to be defeated by Cyazaris, but I wonder if Tiglath Pileser and Cyazaris were leaders of their states at the same time, who would have won in that conflict? It is hard to say. If Cyazaris was still effective in uniting the Medeans with the Chaldeans or the Babylonians, perhaps they might have still won, but perhaps under Tiglath Pileser III's great leadership and uh, military prowess, maybe he would have been able to maintain the Neo-Assyrian Empire. So that is Tiglath Pileser III and the Neo-Assyrian Empire in Sayazaris of the Median Empire. I hope you found these two uh, histories and biographies fascinating or and uh, I hope you continue to support. This is Cashcroft TV, and my name is Kayla Nashcroft. Thank you very much.